Promises that when we come to him in prayer, he said, I will hear and I will answer. So we come before the Lord today in prayer, knowing that he will hear us as we pray and knowing that he will always answer in according to his divine will. So join with me now as we pray together. Lord, we are grateful for the day you've given unto us. We're thankful for the many promises that you have made. We're thankful, Lord, that you're here with us this morning in our worship service. We thank you for the promise that you will never leave us, never forsake us, but in every area of our life that you will be there. So, Lord, today we pray for those who are not able to be with us, those who are physically sick, those in the hospital, those who are mourning the loss of loved ones, those who are going through some very, very difficult times in their life. I pray, Lord, that even as we pray together here, that those who are going through these tough times may know that and have that assurance that we are praying for them. May your Holy Spirit minister to their needs today. Lord, we're thankful for the church. We're thankful that we have the privilege to minister together for you. I pray, Lord, that for every person here today, that by your Holy Spirit, you would encourage, challenge, and strengthen. As we continue our worship before you this morning, may you be honored. May you be glorified in everything that is said and done May it all be for the glory and the praise of Christ, our Redeemer, and soon coming King. Amen. We're going to sing a song this morning called, Lord, I Need You. And it just talks about how every hour of every day uh, we need the Lord. And sometimes we may feel like we need to lean on Him more than others but as we sing that this morning some of you may need to hear this song so i invite you to stand if you can if you will and sing lord i need you Yeah. 
blessing upon his word. Father, we are grateful for the word of God. We're thankful, Lord, that you do speak to us today. You meet us where we are. You know all about us. You know our fears. You know, Lord, the future. And so I pray today as we open the word of God that likewise you would open our hearts to receive what you have for us today. For it's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Today we begin our series on prophecy. If there is a God, and there is a God, and if he is in control of the world, and he is, does he have anything, have anything to say to us about our world today? Does he have anything to say to us about the year 2015 or in the future? What does God's word have to say? He is God. He is in control. So what does he have to say to us? about the day in which we are living, or does he speak to us today? Well, first of all, I want you to remember this. In the 24th chapter of Matthew, Jesus gave many signs that would happen in the last days. After giving those signs, he did say this, no man 
knows the day or the hour when those signs will be fulfilled. So never forget that. Hear people saying, well, Jesus is coming back in such and such a year. The Bible says no one knows. No one knows that. But with that in mind, turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Remember, Jesus said no one knows when he's coming back. Notice, if you will, in chapter 5, 1 Thessalonians, beginning of verse 1. Now, before that, Jesus, or Paul has just talked about the resurrection. Beginning of verse 1, it says, Now concerning how and when all this will happen, dear brothers and sisters, we don't really need to write you. For you know quite well that the day of the Lord's return will come unexpectedly, like a thief in the night. When people are saved, everything is peaceful and secure, then disaster will fall on them as suddenly as a pregnant woman's labor pains begin, and there will be no escape. But, he's talking to Christians, but you aren't in the dark about these things, dear brothers and sisters, and you won't be surprised when the day of the Lord comes like a thief. What's Jesus said? Jesus said, listen, no one knows the day or the hour, but Paul said, listen, Christians, you're not in the dark. You're not like everyone else. You will not be caught unexpected when the Lord comes. So Paul seems to be saying to us that there are some signs in the Scripture that tell us when the Lord's coming, not the year, not the hour, not the day, but will alert us to the fact that Jesus is coming and His coming is very soon. Now remember this, God is a God of law, law and order. Everything that God created operates by law and order. For example, look at the seasons of the year. We always know there's going to be spring, summer, what else? Winter and fall. It's always going to happen. That'll never vary. Never. Night and day. Night always follows day. Day always follows night. Even the tides. Now, fishermen, this is really important. We know exactly when high tide's going to be every day. We know when low tide is going to be, because God's already ordained that, and we know it's by law and order. We know when the sun's going to rise. Look at your news report on it. It says sunrise occurs at a certain time it does. Sunset will come at a certain time, and it does. So God is a God of law and order. Take the word number seven. I'm going to deal on that this morning. The number seven. Think about it. How many notes in all the music that you will ever hear, how many notes are in all of that music? Anyone know? Some of you musicians must know there's seven notes, right? C, D, E, F, G, A, B. All music comes from those seven notes. When you show a light through a prism, what do you get? Seven colors. Three primary, four secondary. It always works the same way. Now, when we look at, at that, how many days? Now, you all know this. How many days are there in a week? Seven, okay? Next question. How many days did God use to create the world? How many? Six. Not seven, six, right? So God created the world in six days. But notice, after creation, he ordained one day for rest. That's the seventh day. The seventh day was ordained by God in the beginning as a day of rest. Now, listen. After the day of rest, that's the seven days for the week. Now, listen. At the end of seven years in the old Hebrew calendar was called a what? A Sabbath year or a Shemitah. At the end of seven years, there was a year of rest. There was during that time, there was no planting, no harvesting. It was a year of rest. You know why God created the seventh day as a day of rest? He created that as a day that we might have rest from labor, but also it was a day that we could pause and remember him and worship him. That's what it's all about. God gave us a great world, everything he created. He said, listen, I'm going to give you six days to work. On that seventh day, 
You take that as a day to rest and to worship me. Now, at the end of the, the seven years, there will be a year of rest. With no planting, no harvesting. A year, to, a year to remember that God is in control. God pro provides everything that we need for our life. Now, turn with me, if you will, to the book of Leviticus, chapter 25. The book of Leviticus, chapter 25. If you don't know where there is, you begin the book of Genesis. Genesis, Leviticus, and then Numbers. So look at Leviticus, chapter 25. And I'm going to begin reading at verse 1. Leviticus chapter 25 and beginning at verse 1. While Moses was on Mount Sinai, the Lord said to him, Give the following instructions to the people of Israel. When you have entered the land I am giving you, the land itself must observe a Sabbath rest before the Lord every seventh year. For six years you may plant your fields and prune your vineyards and harvest your crops. But the seventh year must, seventh year, the land must have a Sabbath year of complete rest. It is the Lord's Sabbath. Do not plant your fields or prune your vineyards during that year. So that was God's rule in the beginning. God gave to his people and said, listen, when you enter into the land, you're going to have those seven years, six years, then a, a year of rest. Now notice, after the seventh year, seven sevens, you have seven years Sabbath, seven years Sabbath. On the seventh Sabbath, Sabbath, which is 49 years, the 50th year is called the year of Jubilee. Year of Jubilee is a, is a super rest year. God created that. God ordained that from the very beginning. Now, if you will look at that slide again, that first one you brought up. There we go. The seventh year shall be a Sabbath of solemn rest. That's what God ordained from the very beginning. Now, listen. This Sabbath was created as a blessing. It was seeing God saying to his people, listen, I love you. I created you. I'm giving you everything. I'm giving you a blessing. My blessing is you will have a time of rest. Now, notice. If that rest is ignored, if God's people ignore that Sabbath rest, that Sabbath rest becomes a warning. It's a warning. Listen, if you don't obey my word and you don't do what I ask you, if you don't worship me, don't reverence me, this will be a warning to you. Let me give you an example of that in the scripture. Turn with me, if you will, to the book of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 25. Jeremiah chapter 25. And we're going to look at verse 11. Jeremiah 25 and verse 11. I'll find it here in a minute. Okay, before that, Jeremiah's talked, read that whole chapter. The whole chapter talks, Jeremiah said, listen, God sent me to give you a warning. I've given you the warning. You have not heeded the warning. Now look if you have verse 11. He said, because you have not heeded my warning, then what God asked you to do, listen, verse 11, this entire land will become a desolate wasteland. Israel and her neighboring lands will serve the king of Babylon for how long? Seventy years. God said, listen, you did not obey my word. You did not observe the Sabbath that I asked you to observe. Therefore, because you've done that, you will have to serve Babylon in captivity for 70 years. Okay, turn back with me, if you will, to the book of 1 Chronicles. 1 Chronicles. If you don't know what that is, find the book of 1 of Kings, 2 Kings. You'll come to 2 Chronicles. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 2 Chronicles chapter 26. Notice what it has to say. Second Chronicles ch uh, chapter 36, not 26. And I want you to look at, at verse 21. 36 and verse 
21. So, this message of the Lord spoken through Jeremiah was fulfilled. The land finally enjoyed the Sabbath rest, lying desolate until the 70 years were fulfilled, just as the prophet had said. The prophet said, listen, because you did not obey the Sabbath, because of that, you're going to have to serve in Babylon captivity for 70 years. Chronicles said, listen, that's what happened. What Jeremiah said would happen, happened because the people of God failed to obey God, failed to observe that Sabbath year. Now, you say, what in the world does that have to do with us today? What does that that, that rule that God put in the Old Testament, what does that have to do with us today? Is there anything about that that touches us in our life today? Now remember, after the seventh year, sixth year is a day of rest. Then the, the seven sevens, 49th, the 50th year. Guess what? The year 2015 is the year of Jubilee on the Hebrew calendar. That's the 50th year. Now notice, all of this goes back to the Old Testament. Today, 2015, is the year of Jubilee, according to the Hebrew calendar. Remember what God's Word said? God's Word says, you are to worship me on the seventh day. On the seventh year, it will be a Sabbath rest. Then after seven of those seven years, the, after the 49th year, there will be a year of Jubilee. That's what God's Word had to say. 2015 is that year of Jubilee, according to the Hebrew calendar. Now, go back from 2015, go back 50 years. That's the last jubilee. What do we go back 50 years? What do we find? Israel got Jerusalem back after the Six-Day War. Isn't that amazing? In God's calendar, go back to the last jubilee. That's when Israel got their freedom, got Jerusalem back. Now, listen. Go back 50 more years, guess what you have? Go back 50 more years, which will be 100 years from now. That was when the Balfour Declaration given Israel back to the Jewish people. Wow. That's fact. I mean, that's just, that's history. We know that to be a fact, according to Chris history. Now, what does that have to do with us today? Well, let me share with you just one area, just one area how the Bible and the Schmidt really affects us today. This is in 2015. I'm going to talk about it in a way that affects not only America, but the whole world. Okay? The whole world is affected by the stock market. I want you to notice, I want you to notice the, what the Bible has to say about that. Now, I'm going to go back before, actually, before the, the slide that's coming up now. I'm going to go back to the year 1902 to 1903. That's when this Schmidt took place. At that time, 47% of the stock market was lost. That was in the year of the Schmidt. Okay, go back to uh, 1916 and 1917. Again, year of the Schmidt, that Sabbath year. Guess what? The stock market lost 40%. Now, this is, this is history, but it also goes back what the Bible talks about the Shemitah, okay? Now, if you go back to the slide you just had up, I'm going to show you beginning in at, at 19 and 30 to 32. And September the 2nd, 1931, was the end of the Shemitah. Listen, eight days later, eight days later, England abandoned the gold standard, setting off bank closures and market crashes. 86% the market was lost. All tied, can't get away from it, that's history, but it also goes back to what the Bible has to say. Okay, let's go on. 37, 38, 19, uh, 37, 38. Schmitten began on September the 6th, 1937. Guess what? The very next day, the stock market crashed. Is that just by, by coincidence that all these things happen? It's all history. It's all right there for you. 1972 to 73. Again, the next Schmittner there. Four months after, four months after, four months after the Schmittner began, the stock market began to collapse. It's history. Go back and read it. 
2000 and 2001, we're getting closer to home now. 2000, 2001, the stock market collapse began with the dot com, then came what? 9 11. 9/11. 37% of the market was lost then. All again tied to the Schmittina, according to the Word of God. But then you go back, well, this is here, this is actually takes place. Okay. 2007, 2008. Now, just prior to that, the stock market actually was growing. 2007, 2008, during the years of Schmittina, the worst financial crisis since the Great Depression took place. Wow. All tied. You see, God's word, it can never be broken. God's word says, listen. This is what's going to happen. If you don't obey my word and you don't obey what I'm saying, the Schmittina will become a warning to you. And that's what we find in history all the way through. Now, let's go on to the, to the next slide. Okay. Let me read that. Okay. From 1973, from January to October, the stock market lost 48%. November 1980 to August 82, lost 27%. August 1987 to October, the market lost 33%, knowing it's like Monday. March 2000 to 2001, market lost 49%. October 2007 to December 2007, the market lost 56%. Wow. Keep it rolling. Okay. Now listen. These are facts. The greatest financial point, turning points in the last 40 years have been connected to the Schmitten or its way 100% of the time. 100%. Okay. The greatest financial turning points, peaks, or long-term collapses the past 40 years have taken place within the biblical year of the Schmitten or its way 100% of the time. Where there's been both a financial collapse and an economic recession, the period connecting their starting points has fallen within the biblical Schmittina is 100% of the time. What does the Bible have to say to us today? Well, when you go back and read what the scripture has to say, there's a lot going on there. A lot going on. The Bible does speak to us today. This is, this is now. Listen, we're in the year of Jubilee. We're in the year of Jubilee, on the Hebrew calendar, this year is the year of Jubilee. The year of Jubilee actually ends in 2016, but we're in that year. What's going to happen? What's going to happen now? Well, Jonathan came, who was the author of the book, The Mystery of the Shemitna. He was at a, a prophetic conference called the Pro Prophecy and News Conference in Orlando, Florida, in March of this year. And this, this is what he had to say that Mar in March of this year. He said, and I quote, I believe a great shaking is going to come to this land and to the world that will involve the collapsing of the American economy and the removal of its blessings and prosperity. That's what he had to say. On May the 13th, this is unusual, May the 13th, 2014, the French foreign min minister was welcomed to the United States by the Secretary of State, John Kerry. He made, a, he made a speech, and I'm going to quote for you just a portion of his speech. In that speech, he made an unexpected announcement. Listen to what he had to say, and I quote him. We have 500 days to avoid a climate chaos, and I know President Obama and John Kerry himself are committed on this subject, and I am sure that with them and a lot of other friends, we shall be able to reach success in this very important matter. In fact, he repeated that statement three times in the speech. Now listen, you go back to May 13, 2014, and you count forward 500 days. Guess what that date comes to? September the 24th, 2015. Well, in the year of the Jubilee. And I could go on and on and give you what others have to say, but even people who are not Christian, they're, they're saying something's going to happen. 
Something's going to happen in our world. What's it going to be? Let me tell you, I don't know. <laughs> no one knows, but I do know this. I know that the word of God can never be broken. And when God's word has to say applies to us today, I don't know what all this means, but I do know this. I know that history has been fulfilled right down the line. When God's word is forgotten, when God's people forget the word of God, when nations forget what God has to say, God said, listen, I'm going to send you some warnings. The stock market, go back and look at the stock market. All down the line, God's been given warning after warning after warning after warning. I'm going to tell you this. I know from what I read in the Bible, if I was not a Christian, I'd want to be a Christian before I leave this place today. Jesus said, no one knows the day or the hour when I'm coming back. But he said, I want you to know you're Christians. I want you to know you're not going to be surprised because you're going to be expecting it. Why do we expect it? We know what the word of God has to say. We know what prophecy has to say. And listen, if you have family or friends who are not saved, I'm telling you, you'll be on your knees every day saying, oh, God, have mercy. God, have mercy on my son, my daughter, my aunt, my uncle, my next-door neighbor, my friend. They're not saved. I know from your word you're coming again. You're coming soon. Let me say to those who are watching by you stream and, and you too, I know many of you watch in that they cannot go to church and praise God for it, but listen, for those of you, you, and I'm going to talk to them. Y'all just listen a minute. I'm going to talk to them. You need to get out of your house and get to a church somewhere on Sunday morning. Amen, church? Amen. Because listen, God's word is true. If you're not ready to meet God, you say, well, I, I'm a Christian, then get out of there and do something about it. God said to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy. It's a day of remembrance, a day to remember who God is, a day to say thank you, God, for your blessings, not a day of saying, well, it's all mine. God said, yeah, you forget the Sabbath. And there's some warnings coming. The warning is in the word of God. I have so much more I'm going to share with you from prophecy. But listen, folks. I believe we're living not in the last days, but the last of the last days. I'm excited. I'm telling you, there may not be a next Sunday. And if there's not, well, praise the Lord, I won't get to preach next Sunday. <laughs> we'll be in the kingdom. But listen, listen, be, be sure that you're ready. Be sure you're ready. The Bible is not an out-of-dated book. It's up to date. It tells you like it is. The prophecies say, listen, it's going to happen. It's going to take place because God's word says so. And the Shemitah has proven that over and over and over again. God has been given warning year after year after year after year in the Shemitah. Folks, it's time for the church to be the church. It's time for God's people to be people of prayer People who say, we're going to rise up and be the church. We're going to be what God wants us to be in these last days of history. Jesus is coming soon. I don't know when. I wish I could say he's coming before next Sunday. I don't know. He may. But I do know this. He is coming. His word is true. If he doesn't come before next Sunday, I want to share with you more of what God's word has to say about prophecy in the last days. Father, I'm excited as I read the word. But also, Lord, I'm burdened for those who do not know you. So many friends that I have, Lord, that's on my prayer list. Lord, I want to see them saved. I want to see them come to you before you come again. Lord, I know there are others in this church who have family and friends who are not saved. Lord, you've given us warnings. You've given us warnings that this day will not catch us unprepared. We know it's coming. 
Lord, there may be some here this morning who cannot say in their heart, I know that I know that I know that if Jesus comes right now, I'm ready. I'm ready. Lord, may not one person leave the house of God today before they know in their heart they're ready to meet you. Thank you again for your blessings. Thank you, Lord, for giving us your word to show us the day and the hour in which we live. Most of all, Lord, I'm thankful you're coming again. You're coming soon. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Closing this morning, we're going to sing one verse of a hymn. As Greg comes to lead us, and if you're not saved today, let me just invite you to come today and accept Christ as your Savior. Maybe you're here this morning and you have family or friends or whatever that are not saved. Maybe you'd just like to come and, and just stand here with me. And, and by standing here with me, you're saying, we're going to be praying for our friends and loved ones who are lost. We're going to spend a lot of time singing. God speaks to your heart. You come as we stand and sing. Let's stand together. as I pray for these who have come today with a burden up on their heart for friends and family that are not saved. Let's pray together. Lord, you have taught us that you would honor your word. And you have taught us, Lord, that if we come before you in prayer, that you will hear. Lord, there are many here this morning with burdens upon their heart, their family and friends, who are not saved. Lord, I pray that you would hear their prayers. I pray, Lord, that as we continue to pray, that you will answer, that you would touch hearts and lives, that we'll see family and friends coming to know you and being prepared for that day, whenever that day is that you come. Thank you, Lord, for hearing us as we pray. Thank you for the answers that are already on the way and those who will be saved because we prayed together today and we'll continue to pray. In the matchless, precious name of my almighty God and soon coming King, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. My prayer for you this week that you'll live an exciting week. That you'll know that Jesus is coming again and you're ready. It's going to be a great week. And continue to pray for those who need Jesus as Savior. Amen? Amen. God bless you and have a great week.